Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mike Bavin and I'm the president of the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association. My father, Alfred Babin of the Royal Rifles of Canada was a Canadian Hong Kong veteran. Our topic this evening is the World War II civilian internment in Hong Kong presented by Martin Hayes and Julien Leu. And we'll get to their presentation in a moment. I expect uh, most of you by now are familiar with how our events work, but for the first timers among you, I'll give you a quick tutorial. And in fact, as there are a number of folks watching from Hong Kong who may not be familiar with our association itself, let me spend a minute to tell you about us. The Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association or the HKVCA exists to ensure that the role of Canadian soldiers in the Battle of Hong Kong is never forgotten. With only four Canadian Hong Kong veterans remaining alive today, this work is essential. In addition to educational events such as this one, we operate a website at www.hkvca.ca, which contains a wealth of material on Canadians' role in the battle, biographical information about many of the 1,975 Canadians who fought in Hong Kong, and much more. Our Facebook pages are very active as well, with a very rich information, information exchange constantly going on. Now to the tutorial that I promised. The camera on your device is not activated and your microphone is muted. You will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speakers both during and after their presentations. At the bottom of your screen, you should see an icon marked Q&A. If it's not there, try tapping your screen once and moving your cursor to make it appear. You can use this icon to send us a text message with your question at any time. When you've typed your question, tap close to return to the presentation. At the end of the presentation, our speakers will answer the questions that you've submitted. And we've also set up a Facebook page for you to discuss the presentation and ask further questions. And I'll tell you about this in more detail later on. Uh, a final note, we are recording this event and the recording will be available on the HKVCA website. Once again, that's www.hkvca.ca. And don't hesitate to uh, recommend it to your family and friends. And now to tonight's program. Our events normally uh, deal with uh, the situation of the Canadian soldiers who were sent to Hong Kong as part of Sea Force in 1941. But this evening's presentation is a little bit different, dealing with the internment of the civilians uh, during uh, or after the Battle of Hong Kong, some of whom were Canadian. So we have two speakers this evening, as I mentioned before, and our first speaker, Martin Hayes, joins us from Hong Kong, where it's uh, just after 7.30 in the morning. Martin was born and brought up near Liverpool in the UK, he entered the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in 1971, from where he was commissioned in the British Army, serving in the UK and Germany. Upon leaving the Army, Martin joined the Royal Hong Kong Police, with whom he served until his retirement. He's currently employed as a tour guide in Hong Kong, specializing in walks of the territory's World War II battle sites. Martin completed a Master of Arts degree in public order while serving with the police and has contributed articles on military history to the Journal of the Orders and Medals Research Society. Julien Leu, who will follow Martin, is speaking to us from Montreal. Martin graduated with a master's degree in history from Université du Québec à Montréal in 2021. He specialized in the internment of the Canadians in Hong Kong from 1941 to 1943. He's currently pursuing a second master's degree in museology and now works for the Quebec-based educational program, Je Me Souviens. Je Me Souviens is an educational program of the Canada Company, which is a charity that celebrates Canada's military heroes and their families through education and support, such as bursaries and scholarships. It works with several Quebec regimental museums to provide free teaching materials to supplement the Quebec high school history curriculum offering turnkey activities, traveling exhibitions, and interactive online exhibitions, Jim Souvien strives to help students have a greater knowledge of Quebec's role in military conflicts throughout the last more than 100 years. And you can find their resources at www.jimassouvien.org. So those are our speakers. And now, uh, welcome, gentlemen. And please go ahead, Martin. <laughs> 
Okay. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone, or good evening, as the case may be. I know it's, as Mike said, it's just after 7.30 in the morning here in Hong Kong. It's uh, evening in Canada, I know, and even later in UK, if we've anybody from uh, UK listening, stroke watching. Um, a slight apology, if I may, at the very, very beginning. Some of you who have a better hearing than me might be able to hear a, a bird in the background. Surprisingly, in Hong Kong, um, I wait to the dawn chorus of birds and not traffic because we're living out in the, uh, the wilds of the new territories here, which is rather nice. OK, so when Mike first contacted me towards the end of last year, uh, and of course, Julianne, uh, he very kindly and helpfully um, gave a list of um, topics, as it were, uh, by way of an outline that he would like both of us to cover. So I've used that as, as a guide and um, will basically divide my talk up um, into those various headings. And the second one, which Mike listed, which I'll actually talk about first, uh, were reasons uh, the Japanese interned civilians. And if we could go to the first slide, please, Mike. Um, we have here a quote from a Japanese historian, as you can see, uh, Yutsumi Aiko. I apologize if I pronounced that wrongly. My Japanese is not terribly good. <laughs> I'll read that out just in case anyone is having a few problems with possibly the slides or the video or whatever. Um, Japan went to war with virtually no policy for the treatment of prisoners, especially enemy civilian internees. It could further be said that this problem was not even one of great concern for the Japanese government. Now that might come as, thank you, Mike, that might come as something of a surprise. Um, it certainly did to me when I first started looking at this subject. Obviously, with um, military prisoners, and there were many of, of all nationalities, um, you just put them into the various camps that had hitherto been used, the barracks that had been used by the soldiers or the military people. Um, surprisingly, as you can see from that quote, the Japanese did not have an official policy. Um, I think it's a, uh, this is the appropriate moment for me to mention that um, in fairness to the colonial government, and in fairness to the home government, if you like, but particularly the, the Hong Kong government, um, this had been a problem uh, which had been envisaged some time before. The colonial authorities, as early as 1940, had brought about, or set into place, if you will, um, legislation, which was later challenged, in, in fact, in court, uh, requiring non-essentials, as the term used, to leave Hong Kong. Now, let's be quite clear about this, non-essentials really uh, meant women and children, and a little bit possibly sexist in modern terminology, but that was the thinking at the time. It was the women and children um, who were supposed to leave, and many did, and many followed the rule, and many did not. Some, they were required to go to Australia. Um, what was very conveniently, and some would say overlooked, um, at the time was that Australia had what was known as a white Australia policy. And so when the ship taking um, people to uh, Australia called in to the Philippines, called into Manila, you were basically looked up and down, you were checked, and if you weren't pure white, you were supposed to go back. Um, some did and some did not, some slipped through the net. As I say, there were people that should have left and did, but there were many who should have left who didn't or who who, if they did leave, somehow got back. Um, a number of women stepped forward and took first aid classes at the YMCA, whatever, um, and said, right, I'm now a trained first aider, you're going to need me, um, and therefore don't send me away. And there were any number of um, accounts that, uh, you know, one can read about what went on. Tony Bannum has written a very good book. Uh, on this subject. Um, so there were quite a large number of people, uh, civilians uh, in Hong Kong, who perhaps uh, shouldn't have been here. Oh, okay, on the other hand, it has to be said there were many who, um, who, who were legitimately here. 
How many are we talking, you may ask? Well, it's difficult to answer. Um, one could give a ballpark figure, around about, say, two to 3,000. It has to be a little bit varied because um, obviously there were people coming and going, and we'll go into all that in a bit more detail further into the talk. But we are talking in the thousands. Um, if you um, go down to part of the camp, again, subject we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, um, St. Stephen's College, um, which comprise one of the three main parts of the internment camp, you will see a red plaque on the wall at the entrance to the school, and it just says thousands. That's the figure that just says this was the site of part of the internment camp where thousands of civilians were imprisoned um, between 1942 and 1945. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please, Mike. Thank you very much. I have there um, a map of Hong Kong Island, as you can see. Uh, I'll talk about where the camp was again in a minute, but before I do that, I just want to mention that, um, pick up from the last bit, of, as it were, the last point um, the, the Japanese historian makes, um, they didn't really know what to do with these people. Um, the British surrendered on Christmas Day. Now, one of the things I'm not going to do, and I don't apologize for this, is talk about the, the battle itself. We really could be here all day or all night, as the case may be, um, and that's a separate thing altogether. Suffice it to say that following 18 days of fighting, uh, starting in the new territories up to the north of the map you're looking at there, and uh, you can just uh, see the tip of the Kowloon Peninsula, uh, north of um, Hong Kong Island. Um, thank you, Mike. The Japanese uh, captured the, the new territories uh, and Kowloon, um, having invaded the colony on the 8th of December 1941. Uh, by the 12th, they captured what was then known as the mainland, i.e. NT, new territories and Kowloon. They then followed a five, six day hiatus whilst the Japanese called on the British to surrender the island and thereby surrender the whole of the colony. This the Brits refused to do. And so some five or six days after capturing the mainland, um, the uh, Japanese launched their attack on the island and they launched it from the, uh, the Leung Passage you can see on the eastern or the right hand side. Thank you again, Mike, the Devil's Peak area. And they landed on a frontage from North Point um, stretching down uh, southeast to Shaokiwan, uh, Taiwan. And they then pushed inland to the Wong Nai Chong Gap in the center of Hong Kong Island and also southward. Having done that, they effectively captured the whole of Hong Kong by Christmas Day, the whole of the island, which surrendered, uh, thereby made, um, or rather caused the, the surrender of the whole of the colony. The um, as I say, the British, uh, sorry, the Japanese were then confronted with all these uh, civilians. So what they, were they going to do with them? Well, initially, uh, there wasn't much happening. People sort of tended to stay where they were. Uh, that wasn't uh, all beer and skittles, as the saying goes. It, you know, life was a bit grim and, and, to put it bluntly, very, very dangerous. There were roaming gangs of bandits who picked up arms and ammunition that had been abandoned and left on the battlefields uh, and so it was rather dangerous and we got accounts of people sort of particularly those on the peak getting together and and uh, huddling if you will um, in, in uh, houses and flats and so on on the peak for protection. Eventually however something had to be done and the majority of um, civilians were marched off to um, accommodation in central district, Sung Wan area. Um, grim to say the least. These were brothels um, and it has to be said of, of the lowest order, all long, long disappeared, of course. Um, and there they were housed. There, you know, you can imagine these were Europeans who'd been living in many, many cases, probably most cases in relative luxury, suddenly housed in these rather dreadful conditions. Um, and so obviously this could only be a temporary measure. Um, so what were they going to do with them? Well, there were a couple of suggestions put forward. Uh, one I like particularly came from a chap by the name of Sir Athel McGregor, uh, who uh, was the Chief Justice at the time. And um, you can imagine his lifestyle um, before the war, very, very senior official. Um, he went by the nickname, by the way, of Sir Alcohol McGregor, 
I don't think I need to dwell on that too much, uh, in the internment camp. Uh, he died actually uh, at sea on the way home, obviously um, at the end of the uh, occupation, going back to, to Britain. Obviously he'd been uh, uh, subject to some pretty awful treatment and he would have been no young man, obviously. So he actually died um, on his way back to, to, to Blighty at the end, of the, uh, the end of the war. He stepped forward and suggested the peak where he'd lived. And again, one reads accounts of how he thought, well, I've got a good chance of having my house included in that. And uh, th if it's included in the camp, you know, obviously there'll be people living in it and that mean it won't get looted and, and, and smashed up and, and all that sort of thing, which, which went on everywhere, pretty much everywhere else. Um, the Japanese were not having any of that. Um, they would not allow um, Europeans uh, to look down on them in, 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 in all senses of the word. Obviously, by living on the peak, you're talking way, way above the, you know, lat <laughs> latitude, if you will, of, of, of everybody else down in the city below. So, so that couldn't happen. Um, and also looking down on them in, in the other sense of the word. So the peak, I'm afraid, was a no-no as far as the Japanese were concerned. I have read also that um, a college, La Salle, one of the very distinguished schools in Hong Kong, in Kowloon, um, uh, was put forward as an internment camp. Germans had been interred there on the outbreak of the, the war in 1939, um, but that didn't happen. A suggestion to move um, Europeans to one of the islands, Taiwan, Formosa as it was then, um, or Hainan Island. Again, these were put forward. None of them acceptable to the Japanese. Cometh the hour, cometh the man, as the saying goes. And at this point, I'm going to hold up, I don't know if this comes across okay, um, a book by the name of, title I should say, of Footprints, um, written by a gentleman known as Sir Selwyn, Selwyn Clark, the memoirs of Sir Selwyn, Selwyn Clark. Uh, to keep it simple, I'll just use his surname. He was actually christened Selwyn Clark. Uh, he served as a medical doctor in World War I. And he found that, according to his um, autobiography, he found that he was getting the mail uh, of a chap with the same name uh, in the same division. And this was a little bit confusing. So he found a solution as far as he was concerned. He called himself Selwyn, Selwyn Clark. As I say, a medical doctor. And um, he came out to Hong Kong, having served in Africa, and very much the colonial servant, um, not long before the outbreak of the Pacific War. And he was the director of medical services. And he put forward Stanley. And you can see the Stanley Peninsula there, clearly marked. Thank you, Mike, again, at the uh, southeast tip of Hong Kong Island. And to the right, of course, is the Sheko Peninsula. But we're concerned with the Stanley Peninsula. And of course, it, this, this ticked all the boxes, um, I would say, as far as the Europeans were concerned, given that they had to have, be in internment, obviously they would have wished they weren't, um, it also satisfied the Japanese. Um, it was out of town, out of sight, out of mind, you could say, it was far from the centre of population, Stanley was a little bit more deserted then as, than it would be now. Uh, it was um, healthy. As you can see, it's close to the sea. You've got Stanley Bay on the west side and Titan Bay on the eastern side of the peninsula. Uh, and basically, there were three parts to the camp. Um, and we'll look at a, a couple of sketches in a minute or two um, to the camp, but I just want to <coughs> um, describe it here, if I may. Um, three main parts. The first part was Stanley Prison. Now, Stanley Prison had been built late 30s. Um, it was said at the time by the British colonial authorities just in time to have themselves locked up in it. The prison, however, uh, although the Japanese did um, at times put internees who they wanted um, to punish for whatever reason, and other prisoners of war actually, um, particularly males, um, they did lock them up in the cells of the prison. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they just generally used the quarters um, of the warders. The warders pre-war were primarily either Brits or expats and uh, Indians. And so they used um, the quarters 
uh, of the um, uh, of the warders, uh, the quarters blocks uh, as accommodation. Um, they also used St. Stephen's College. Now the college, again, I won't go into the history of, of that. It goes back to the early years of the 20th century, not where they uh, were later moved to. They were originally in Pot Fulham area on the western side of Hong Kong Island. Um, but they um, had moved, they wanted a bigger campus, the school wanted a bigger uh, campus in the late 20s, 1930, 31, that sort of time, and they moved to Stanley, and uh, the uh, blocks of the um, school, the school classrooms and other buildings, um, uh, were used for accommodation. The third part of the camp uh, was Stanley Cemetery, and again, we could go back a long way there, but I believe, suffice it to say that that had been opened as far back as the 1840s. Uh, the original garrison had been uh, part of the garrison, British garrison had been stationed in Stanley area, and uh, soldiers and their families had died, of course, and had been buried there. The cemetery was closed in around about the 1870s, and it uh, was reopened um, to bury um, internees who died, some 120 or so who died in captivity. So the cemetery um, formed part of the camp. Um, in January 42, uh, the camp was opened. And if we could go to the slide, Mike, um, sorry, the next one, please. Oh, sorry, yes, um, I ought to point out that rather Churchillian looking gentleman on the left uh, is, um, the governor at the time, Sir Mark Young. Um, he does look rather Churchillian to me anyway. I, I'm sure he could almost pass for Churchill in one of those more um, recent uh, films made about Churchill. <laughs> um, he was not interned. Uh, well, he was, but not in Stanley. Uh, he was actually sent off to um, Formosa at some point, Taiwan now, and uh, also Shenyang or Mukden as it would be then up in what is now Liaoning province up in the north part of China. So we won't talk too much on the governor. The gentleman on the right, the medal figure, is Sir Selwyn, Selwyn Clark. He later became a colonial governor. Incidentally, he died a year after um, this book was written, 75 or there, about 1975. Sorry, Mike, I apologize. It was the next one I wanted. We've looked at that one, please move on. Uh, here we have um, a plan of the camp. Um, now, um, the internees were brought from Central. They were told to fall in. Again, people in Hong Kong will know the area, I'm sure. Uh, the Murray Barracks Parade Ground, where the Chung Kong Center is now. Uh, they were told to fall in, basically, and they weren't given an awful lot of notice. And I don't think they were given an awful lot of information either. Um, in other words, they weren't told, right, listen in, you lot. You're now going to go to Stanley. Well, they were told that, but you know, it wasn't a case of this is what's going to happen. Bring this, bring that. It was all a little bit vague. And um, I have read of an account of some people who were able to ask a policeman, well, we've been told to fall in. What's going to happen? Are oh, you going to be taken into camp? Oh, so better grab some stuff. Uh, again, I've read an account of one lady who, um, a mother who got her 10 year old or thereabout son to wear a great coat. She put a um, dressing gown cord round him and um, festooned uh, um, pots and pans and goodness kettles and knives and forks and goodness knows what on his belt. So she went in quite prepared. But many of them, of course, didn't have that luxury. And they were going in with really what they were told, bring what you can carry if, if, if they got that information. Um, so, you know, they, a lot of them went in a little bit, shall we say, ill-prepared. Um, but they were fallen in, they were taken down to the ferry pier, they were taken by boat around to St. Stephen's Beach, um, where the jetty is now, it's the original jetty. They were then taken off the ferries and shipped ashore, uh, and walked up the what was then a dirt track, uh, to metal road now leading into the camp. Um, now we have here uh, a plan um, based on a sketch drawn by a repatriate, as you can see at the bottom, in 1943. And I think that was actually drawn by a Canadian. Uh, if not a Canadian, and I don't want to steal any of Julien's thunder here, so I won't say too much, uh, it would be an American. Um, and again, those who have been to Hong Kong, or certainly those who live here will, rec will, live here, will recognize that. Um, you've got the road 
um, leading down to um, into, into, into town uh, and the road going down towards Stanley Prison um, and the road the other one of course going to Stanley Port, Tung Tao Wan and Wang Tao Hom, Wang Tao Tung roads. Okay again people that know the area um, will, will recognize that. So you've got the road there um, on the, the lower one as it were, it says camp boundary, that's leading as you can see on the left hand side to the prison uh, beyond that is Tweed Bay and you can see bathing beach and that is where a lot of the internees when they were allowed to bathe by the Japanese were able to do so. Pre-war that had been a private beach for the governor, governor's beach. When the prison was built it was all sort of somewhat restricted and um, uh, of course as I say it could be used by the internees. Uh, you've got the um, various um, uh, warders quarters there to the lower part of the sketch. Um, to, thank you, Mike. To the north of the road marking camp boundary, uh, you've got the school buildings. And then you can see their cemetery on the left-hand side. And that basically uh, was it. Um, you can see the road, it says, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to make it out myself, um, dirt road used by Japanese supplies to Stanley and then you've got pier at the top there and that is where the internees came ashore um, and walked up that road into the camp. Um, one could go on and on about you know how, how it all took a while to get sorted out um, looking at my notes um, so I'll, perhaps I'll just cover that fairly quick. It was a bit chaotic to be, to be quite honest from what I've been able to study and read. Um, the Americans um, got themselves sorted out quite quickly. There weren't so many Americans, obviously, in comparison to um, British. British made up by far the majority. We're talking well into four figures, 1,500 or so Brits. Um, and there are all sorts of stories abound, you know. Um, some of them, I'm sure, are very apocryphal, um, a sort of rather portly, um, middle-aged lady, British lady who obviously been a little bit sort of you know high up on the social pecking order looking around and rather disdainfully and saying oh look at these Americans and aren't they lucky having so many of the working class in the camp because of course the Americans were setting to and getting the place habitable whereas the Brits were sort of standing around uh, waiting for their servants to come and do that sort of thing for them again somewhat apocryphal I'm sure many of these stories um, but um, they were left to their own devices, it has to be said, to begin with. The Japanese had brought in workmen to install barbed wire, we, we're told that certainly um, was um, very much fact of life, um, but they had to basically get themselves sorted. Um, they obviously had to make the accommodation habitable. You can imagine with the fighting that had gone on, particularly in the um, St. Stephen's College grounds, um, there were bodies lying around, there were blood-stained walls and floors, there was detritus of the war, there were arms, in it, arms and ammunition, grenades, all this sort of thing was, was very much in evidence and all this had to be cleared. They had to establish committees. Where were people going to go? Where were they going to sleep? How could you stop families getting split up? All that sort of thing had to be sorted out and in fairness it took time um, and it was a bit chaotic as I'm sure th that's understandable um, but eventually order if I could use that term order was restored and these various organizations and bodies etc um, were established. Um, how many were interned and where? Well we've covered I think covered that pretty much. We're talking between two and three thousand. There was one body of men, and I'm not being sexist when I say that, uh, who were not interned to begin with. But there were a few groups of men, but one I will highlight uh, were bankers, men who worked for um, the European banks, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, the Standard Chartered and other, other banks. Now they were not interned to begin with. They were kept in their rather grim accommodation down in Central. And they were kept out of the camp um, deliberately uh, to um, 
liquidate the bank's assets. The Japanese um, eventually were able to, why well, they just didn't use brute force and ignorance, I don't know, but they eventually were opened um, uh, safe deposit boxes of many of the internees. And of course, they took out what they wanted in terms of anything valuable, um, but other things and marriage licenses, and wedding certificates or birth certificates, this sort of thing, in many cases found their way into the camp sometime later and to the intern, to the owners, one hopes. Um, but these guys were kept out of the camp and they were marched on a daily basis to their bank offices in Central. Eventually, however, they were interned. Um, other men uh, and or some women were not interned. Selvin Clark, who I talked about already, uh, he initially uh, was not interned. The most senior um, Hong Kong government servant, not the governor, as I've mentioned already, uh, the colonial secretary, later Sir Franklin Jimson. Uh, he had the misfortune to arrive in Hong Kong um, literally just the day or two before the uh, Japanese invasion. Talk about frying pan fire, etc. Um, he was not interned initially, although uh, later was. So it wasn't a case of everybody going in straight away. Selvin Clark was kept out on uh, basically in the French hospital, St Paul's Hospital in um, uh, Causeway Bay to sort of assist there although later was in turn. Um, so, um, as I say, not, not everyone went in straight away. Norwegians, incidentally, were not um, in turn to begin with. They were allowed to stay out of camp, but they had to give their word that they wouldn't try and escape. And I'll talk about escapes in a short while. Two of them, however, did do so, and that meant that the um, Norwegian inhabitants of Hong Kong uh, were interned, uh, about 50 or so, and they were interned in uh, what is, um, was termed the Dutch block. Uh, if we go to the next, the, uh, we've got another slide, Mike, I think, of the um, internment camp. There we go. Thank you very much. And you can make out there in the centre, thank you again, Mike, pointing it out, Dutch block. There were actually three races inhabited there. The Norwegians were moved in, so they had the lower, the later plans, you see um, Dutch Norwegian bloc. They were moved into the ground floor. Uh, I think the Dutch had the second and the Brits who had been in there uh, were moved to the top. So there was a bit of a squeeze. Um, so, as I say, there was, a, there was comings and goings is probably the, um, the best way to describe. Um, were there any other camps in Hong Kong is one of the points Mike has mentioned in his um, in his notes to me. The answer is not really. There were no there was no other internment camp as we know it. There was a camp, however, um, for what the Japanese call third nationals. These were people who were uh, not uh, from countries at war with Japan, um, and so they were housed in. Uh, it's long gone, of course. Um, what is now the Rosary Hill School or that area. Stubbs Road, and they were known as third nationals. A lot of Czechs, I know, were um, interned there. So I suppose you could say you could say that was an, in, an internment of sorts. And of course, I've not deliberately not touched on the um, military camps. Uh, the the two, of course, in Kowloon, um, Argyle Street and Prince Edward Road, uh, and there were camps for Indian soldiers. Um, what were conditions like in the internment camp? Well. Thereby hangs a tale. How does one answer that one? Uh, I think if one has to sum it up in, in one word, and I'll try and do so, and that is grim. Um, there are and have been a number of books written by uh, internees, and that's where it becomes in, in some ways frustrating, but in other ways terribly satisfying, sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? Um, but so many people over the years, unfortunately, so many of these people have now passed away, but so many people have written about Stanley. Um, diaries, in many cases, they probably weren't intended to be published, but they have been. Uh, accounts, which were very much for public consumption. Um, reports. Um, goodness knows, there's so much out there now. Um, it's, it's difficult to know where to begin. Um, we do have, as I say, a, a, a tremendous um, idea, as much as we can ever get from reading and studying it, perhaps, um, of, of what things were like. But of course, that no, doesn't come close to um, obviously experiencing itself. 
Um, there are two there are two sort of areas I think which come across very very keenly if I could use that word um, that the Japanese um, sorry that the internees uh, talked about experienced felt however one wants to put it uh, one of course was the food that was the um, the thing which was on everybody's mind morning noon and night uh, not enough of it uh, and repatriation now I'll talk about the second one first people were and again I don't want to tread on uh, Julien's toes here, so I'll be a little bit uh, cagey, uh, if I could say it. Um, Canadians were repatriated, as were Americans, and there were other repatriations as well, but they were the two main groups of people who were repatriated. Um, the Brits never were, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, but one of the things which comes across, and you know, I'm talking about diaries in particular here, and accounts written uh, by people at the time, um, they didn't know, of course. They, they, they didn't know how things were going to, what, what the future held. They couldn't know how things were going to pan out. They held on to the idea of repatriation. Every time a rumour went round the camp, lists were being brought, uh, dug up or made out, whatever, um, pinned on notice boards. The following will go, women and children will go, old people will go. Uh, poems were written, songs were written, uh, everything was repatriation. It wouldn't have been known, I think, to the internees that one of the conditions that the Japanese had stipulated um, for repatriation, as far as the British were concerned, was that they wanted um, Japanese fishermen, pearl fishermen to be exact. This is again, I've had one or two Australians have um, taken issue with this, but bear with me please. Uh, pearl fishermen who had been taken prisoner, if you like, interned by the Australians on the outbreak of um, the Pacific War. These were men who were fishing off the west coast of Australia. They had an intimate knowledge of the Australian coastline, which would have been extremely valuable to um, the Japanese military, the Japanese government, in the event of an invasion of Australia. They were interned by the Australian authorities and um, the, the Australian government said, no way, they're not going anywhere other than a camp in Australia. That's where they're going. And the Australian government were very emphatic about that. And the Japanese said, well, if they're not coming back to Japan, we're not letting the Brits go out of Stanley and presumably other places. So that wouldn't have been known, I think it's fair to say, to the internees until long after the war when those records were, were released. So repatriation, as far as the Brits were concerned, uh, was not going to happen. Um, I hope nobody thinks that I'm sort of copping out, should we say here, when I say that the best way to get an idea of conditions is to have a look, if you can, at some of the books. And before I finish, Michael very kindly put up on the screen um, just a mere fraction of um, some of the stuff available. Um, there's two final points Mike has asked me to cover, and I hope I'm not going over time, Mike. You'll, you'll have to let me know if I am. I apologize if I am sort of overstepping my allotted time here. Um, but um, specific stories about internees. Oh dear, where does one begin? Uh, and the second one is escapes from camp. Uh, perhaps I'll go for escapes first, and you'll forgive me if I just take a sip of my tea. Escape was talked about and it, and it did happen. Um, one of the, um, I'm looking through my um, collection of literature here. One of the books I have, which I thoroughly recommended, I think you can all see that, Prisoner of the Turnip Heads. Rather strange title, you might think. Turnip Heads for those that are not Cantonese speakers. Um, Law Baktau in Cantonese, Turnip Head. And this was a term which um, the, uh, Japan, I'm sorry, the, the uh, local population, the Hong Kong Chinese people, uh, gave to the Japanese soldiers. Apparently it was because of the cloth cap that they wore, uh, which from behind made the Japanese soldier look like a turnip. Perhaps you have to use a little bit of your imagination there. Um, George Wright Newt, the author, uh, was a senior, he went on to very senior rank, a Hong Kong police officer, a Brit, came out to Hong Kong not long before the war. Uh, went into the camp 
uh, survived and, as I say, stayed in the police, rose to quite senior rank. He wrote this book in the mid-90s and uh, not all that long again, I'm afraid, before he died. Um, he devotes a chapter to escape. And um, I'll just mention a couple of um, stories. Um, he talks about uh, one escape. Um, and it's again, it's long, long out of print. Um, if anyone can get their hands on this particular book, it's, it's uh, worth doing so. I think you can possibly make that out. Um, through Japanese barbed wire by a lady by the name of Gwen Priestwood. Gwen Priestwood had been, had been, I have to use the past tense, married to a Royal Air Force officer, but uh, that had finished, I believe. And she went into the camp um, as a single lady. Uh, she made it quite clear, that's what she decided quite early on, um, that she was not going to stay. And she made the acquaintance of a police officer by the name of Walter Thompson. Uh, she wrote her, she got out, the two of them got out. Um, she wrote her book in 1943. Now, of course, we're still in the war at the time. And um, therefore she has to change uh, names and places because of course the first thing that would have happened once the Japanese had got their hands on that when it was published in 43 uh, in the United States uh, is that um, they'd have gone through it with a fine tooth comb and any information they could have gleaned about people who'd given any help to those two um, or places that they went through and so on and so forth um, well that would have been curtains for them so she changes the name of Thompson in the book she calls him Anthony Bathurst. Apparently there was a reason for that, but we won't, well, the reason she chose that name, but she wasn't going to give him his real name. He went on to work for British intelligence and I believe he stayed out in the Far East and she was able to get away. Um, Thompson, as I say, was a useful man to go out with as a police officer, although he was a Brit, he spoke Chinese, so that was useful. Um, and uh, for some reason or other, he managed to, uh, smuggle a 45, a Colt 45 revolver into the camp. Goodness knows why on earth he did that. I think, talk about not exactly increasing your longevity if he'd been discovered in possession of that, but he, he managed to escape with that revolver. Uh, and um, Bright News in his book, as I say, talks quite a bit about this escape in his chapter on escaping, because of course he would have known um, Thompson Stroke Bathurst quite well. They were colleagues. Uh, Wright News goes on to talk about the same time that these two went out, a small party of Americans and Brits, uh, about five in total combined, um, and were able to make their way the other direction. These, these two went across Hong Kong Island, um, through Sha Wan, um, across the harbour and eventually into Sai Kung and way up to the north, etc. The other group I mentioned went out a different way and they went out um, managed to get hold of a boat on Stanley Beach somehow or other um, and made their way to Macau, which of course was technically neutral. And from Macau were able to get into China and, um, and to freedom, quite extraordinary. But there weren't many escapes. There weren't many escapes. Um, again, I think a lot of that is pretty obvious. Um, you were in the unknown, you know, to go out there not knowing the language, of course, you stood out like a sore thumb as a European. Uh, you didn't know if any villages that you came across were going to be friendly or not. The Japanese were out looking for you once they'd known that you'd escaped, etc., etc. Wright News himself, and he makes no apology, and I certainly would pass no judgment. He and another well-known policeman in the camp, George, uh, Kinlock, Wallace Kinlock, were both asked if they would join Thompson, and uh, or if it wasn't Thompson's group, then um, uh, uh, another group. Uh, and uh, Wright News said, no, I didn't. And he makes no apologies for that. And I wouldn't blame him at all. Extraordinarily dangerous, I'm sure. But there were escapes, as I've, as I've mentioned, um, but not too many. Um, I'd like to finish off, Mike. And as I say, I do apologize. I've probably gone over my time. Um, perhaps if we could just go look at a, a few more of the slides just to finish off. That was the pier, St. Stephen's Beach, um, taken from Wright News' book. Uh, where the internees came ashore and as I say they walked up that pier uh, and continued up 
what referred to in 1942 as a dirt track all the way into the camp. Um, and you'll notice at the bottom it says this is the spot where the prisoners landed. The execution ground is to the left. Again, I won't talk about that <coughs> technically. Um, it's a little bit out with the, the area that Mike's asked me to cover, but um, there, were, there were a number of executions, um, not so much of internees, um, but uh, POWs, military men, one or two internees were uh, executed, basically for activities as far as the Japanese were concerned, which ran counter to their interests, um, working for the British Army Aid Group, who were assisting um, POWs, etc., etc. Uh, possession of a radio in the camp. Uh, that was a capital offence. So there were executions uh, in that area, as you can see. Please move on if you would be so kind, Mike. Um, that's a shot of the uh, cemetery uh, taken from the south looking north, rather scenic, as you can see, rather pretty. Um, the rough hewn, as they were once described, uh, blocks that you can see at the bottom of the picture there, uh, these are of internees, as I said earlier in my talk, roughly 120 or so people died. Um, there were doctors and nurses in the camp. Medicine was a problem. There was a hospital, Tweed Bay Hospital <coughs> in the camp. Medicine was a problem, of course. That had to be smuggled in, and it was. Selwyn Clark was involved in some of that. Drugs had to be smuggled in. Uh, but internees inevitably did die, varying various causes. And uh, so the cemetery, as I said to you earlier, was uh, brought back into use, having been discontinued from about the 1870s onwards. And uh, a, a couple of white Russians um, who were, I believe, internees, uh, were, they were policemen. They were uh, found or they stepped forward and said, well, we're, um, you know, we can do a little bit of um, stone masonry or whatever. And so uh, these stone blocks that you see uh, had been earmarked for use as um, milestone marker stones in the new territories pre-war. The new territories was being sort of pretty much developed and roads were being built and so these uh, marker stones, road milestones if you will, uh, were pressed into service as headstones and uh, that is what you're looking at there and they are scattered mainly at the um, southern tip of the cemetery, the cross of remembrance in the centre there and St Stephen's College you can't see is behind the tree line uh, at the very top. Please Mike if you would the next one. Um, these are just some shots, I apologise, they're not terribly brilliant, of the uh, uh, of life in the camp, in, in the internment. The top one there, which unfortunately is a little bit blurred, uh, with the flash, I think it is, or lack of it, uh, it shows the food uh, being brought in. Um, th those are garages, they were garages pre-war, and they, were, they are garages now. Those buildings that are on the left you can't see are off the camera or out of shot. These were uh, known as the American blocks. This is the um, where the Americans were um, housed until they were repatriated. And these were European warders' quarters. Uh, and uh, the uh, garages immediately opposite were pressed into service as the food distribution centre. Um, uh, the, the one on the right there shows some internees in a um, possibly a workshop in the camp doing various things, making various things. It was very much make and mend. Anything was pressed into service. Um, a tire, for example, which might be washed up on Tweed Bay Beach would be cut up and shoes made out of the, um, the rubber and very welcome they were too. Mike, if you could perhaps go to the next. This is an interesting one. And perhaps I perhaps, um, just before we go to the last one, if you could just hold it there, please, Mike. Um, I want you to have a quick look, please, if you would, at the flag raising ceremony. This, of course, is the, the very end of the Japanese occupation, the arrival of the Brits in August 1945. Look there, if you would, please, at the gentleman hoisting the flag. This ties in with Mike's last uh, point for me, some stories about internees. Look at the gentleman raising the flag. His name is Raymond Jones. And I don't know if you can point him out there, Mike, at the bottom. There you go. Thank you very much indeed. Raymond Jones uh, came out to Hong Kong, like many of his generation, apologise for my neighbour starting his rather expensive uh, motor car in the background, if you can hear that. He came out to Hong Kong, um, I would say early 30s, late 20s, early 30s, in the Royal Navy. He was a, a submariner, actually. Like many of his, many, many young men before and certainly after him, he came out of the service and again, like many, uh, he joined of the Hong Kong government. Many of them became policemen, some of them became prison officers, as 
he did. He served with what was known as the Stanley Platoon, a platoon made up of men from the uh, guards of Stanley Prison, European British guards. He survived, of course, and he went into the camp. He kept a diary, which David Dulles, many of you will know, who runs the Hulo.com website, um, serializes a number of internees, diaries, and uh, Raymond Jones is one of them, and very interesting it is too. Um, now then, Raymond Jones uh, followed the rules. Remember I talked earlier about ladies and children, non-essentials being repatriated, being a member of the discipline service, he probably had to follow the rules, and his wife went off to Australia pregnant, heavily pregnant, I believe, but we don't have to go into detail there. And having arrived in Australia, she gave birth to a, a young a little girl by the name of Baby Ray. I should refer to her as Baby Ray because that's how Jones refers to her in his diary. But of course, you remember, he didn't see his daughter until after the war. So Jones went into the camp as a single man, a bit of a ladies' man, got involved with, a, I believe, a Canadian lady who was repatriated. Uh, she gone. And then he got involved with another lady by the name of Gwen Flower. Now then, OK, single lady. Uh, two souls thrown together by war, etc. But it was more than that. As far as Jones was concerned, he was prepared to divorce his wife and marry Gwen Flower at a time when divorce wasn't really perhaps as acceptable or as common as it might be in more recent times. Jones <coughs> said to, he asked Flower to, Gwen Flower to marry him. She said no, because he'd heard that there was a, his wife had given birth. She said there's a child, there's a family involved. If there hadn't been for the child, uh, maybe, but because you're married with a daughter, I'm, it's not going to happen. So at the end of the war, they went their separate ways. He was repatriated, uh, or rather well, re reunited um, with his um, wife and his daughter, who he met for the first time. Uh, he stayed on in Hong Kong. Uh, he stayed in the prison service for a while. He transferred to the public works department. Gwen was repatriated. As I say, a nursing sister, I, so I didn't mention, if I didn't, I apologise, she was a nursing sister and um, she um, went back to UK. Uh, Jones kept a diary, as I say, which his wife Marjorie later discovered. Oh dear, because she read it and there were references to Gwen in the diary. Some would say that wasn't the wisest of things to do, I read it, but she did. And... Um, Jones sort of said, oh, I'll get rid of it, um, but he didn't. He gave it to a friend uh, who worked for the SOE uh, in Hong Kong during the occupation, during the war, and uh, it went to his daughter. The daughter basically reunited it with Hong Kong. She handed it to St. Stephen's College when they established a, a little museum there, the Heritage Gallery. And David Bellis, who I mentioned earlier, has been serializing the diary, uh, out of the blue, a lady got in touch with David Bellis, um, and I hope I've got this right, David, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, it turns out, some years ago, it turns out that that lady uh, was Baby Ray. She was a grandmother by, by this stage in Scotland, and um, she uh, said, I'm the baby that's mentioned in the diary that you're serialising. David reunited the diary with Baby Ray, uh, and uh, there are copies of it in, the, uh, in various places, including... The Heritage Gallery in Hong Kong. Um, UK Press got hold of the story. They loved it. Uh, and they, in true investigative journalist style, they reunited, um, well, they got in touch with um, uh, Baby Ray, and grandmother, and they made some inquiries. And they found that Gwen Flower, she died by this point, she died a few years earlier, but Gwen Flower uh, had never married. Uh, she would, was living at the time of her death in a nursing home in Bournemouth in England. Uh, but they made some inquiries and they found that um, she had in fact been engaged to be married in Hong Kong. Now, the first thing you think of is, um, oh, she was um, engaged to Jones. She changed her mind. But in fact, she hadn't been engaged to Jones at all. She'd been engaged to a Captain Whitney, who was one of the two medical officers murdered in St. Stephen's College on Christmas Day, the two doctors uh, who were there when the Japanese burst in and massacred a large number of uh, men and women, nursing sisters, um, uh, in the college ground, in the school there, which is being used as a hospital. And the, uh, the two doctors were both 
massacred, bur murdered, massacred, whatever. And uh, Captain Whitney was the younger one of the two. Uh, and uh, he had been her uh, Gwen Flowers um, in, uh, fiance. And uh, it's amazing. So he is, of course, one of the um, men buried in the mass grave in um, Stanley Cemetery. So there's a, there's a story, one of a, a thousand stories that um, one could talk about might for internees, but time does not permit. So perhaps if we just finish off on that note, perhaps if you could just quickly put the, some of the books which I've highlighted there. These are some of the books, uh, Gwen Priestwood I've mentioned, uh, Briggs's book, he was an American who um, was repatriated, Gwen Dew, uh, another American journalist, and finally, um, some famous names there, Andy Leiper, uh, Standard Chartered Bank, and of course, Jean Gittins, uh, daughter of um, Sir Robert Ho Tung, who was not interned, she was. And two last ones, Tin Hats and Mice, to David Bellis serializing um, Barbara Anslow's diary there. She died only a year or two ago. Prisoners of the East, a family interned in Stanley. So there you have, I hope I haven't gone too far over, Mike. There you have some stories of um, Stanley internment camp. Well, thank you very much. A very interesting presentation, Martin. And there are some questions for you, uh, which we'll get to after Julien speaks. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting for Julien to uh, rejoin us here with his uh, with his video, I'm just going to to uh, do some technical things here to get uh, Julien's presentation ready. If you'll bear with me. Okay. All right. All right, perfect. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Martin, for this presentation. And I would like to express my gratitude uh, to Mike Pivot and to the HKBCA uh, for this invitation, for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, before, I wanted to, uh, before I begin, I just want to mention, Martin, when you showed your map, of the uh, Stanley Tournament camp in 1943. Uh, I was really happy to see it because when I was in the archives in Ottawa during my research, uh, the um, Canadians report kept mentioning about some map that they were drew, but for some reason the map was never in the archive. I think they just kind of lost it. So it was a big surprise to see it right here. <laughs> so um, before I begin as well, as all of you have probably perceived, uh, English is my second language. I have a pretty thick French Canadian accent and this uh, constitutes my first presentation in another language. So to be honest, I'm a bit nervous, but in that regard, I apologize if I'm completely uh, unintelligible during my presentation. And I will ask all of you to uh, bear through uh, what should be like a very uh, torturous presentation. So Mike, if you want to change the slide, it would be really appreciated. So like I mentioned above, this conference is the result of my research when I was doing my master's thesis in history. And for the sake of this presentation and to properly uh, and company Martin's conference, I took the liberty to focus more on the Canadian experience uh, during their internment and their return to Canada. So I divided this conference into two sections. Uh, the first will briefly talk about the Canadians in Hong Kong, basically who they were, how they lived through the internment, and a small presenter uh, presentation of certain of them. Meanwhile, the second section will focus on the process of the repatriation led by the uh, American government and its discussion with Japan throughout the war. So again, Mike, we can change the slide to go to my first section, the Canadians in Hong Kong. Uh, I think by the time David Bellis will recognize this picture, it's taken from its website, uh, guru.com, which was <laughs> very useful during my research. And well, first thing to know, the Canadians who went to Hong Kong did so a few years before the war for a certain number of reasons, uh, but with most of them relating to, relating to work. So as all of you probably know, the 1930s in Canada was well, it's pretty much worldwide, were economically difficult because of the Wall Street crash of uh, 1929. In China, and particularly in Shanghai and Hong Kong, well, the situation was a bit different because both of them were being city ports with a great access to the entire continent. Uh, there's a lot of colonies, uh, these colonies, I mean, were living through a very big economic expansion that will make any nation at the time envious. So in consequence, there's a certain number of Canadians who travel to these colonies to get work. Uh, either with the governments, like you know, the British or the Canadian government uh, working there, or with some kind of import-export company 
There is, for example, the case of Ernest Robbins, who was previously an employee in British Columbia before, and I quote, going out west in Hong Kong, where he found uh, work as a public servant for the colonial government. Another big reason as to why some Canadians will go to Hong Kong, it's pretty obvious, and it's for missionary work. So starting from 1927, China was a victim of an important civil war between the Guomindang and the communists. So in Quebec, where there's like a big, uh, strong uh, uh, religious community at the time, uh, it was really important to go, to go there and to help the Chinese <coughs> refugees there. So in consequence, we found a certain number of French Canadian sisters among the interns in Stanley Camp. According to my research, I think I found at least nine of them uh, just by their French uh, sounding names and from their uh, address at the time in Montreal. Um, so yeah, at least nine of them. And again, I, according to my research, there's at least 73 Canadian nationals who were interned in Stanley Camp. 73 is very few in comparison with the other internees on Stanley Camp. Like the American mentioned, there were at least like 200 and uh, five, uh, 2,500 uh, internees at, um, at a time. But among the Canadians, well, naturally a lot of them were Canadian natives, you know, or some of them were Canadians who immigrated to Canada at the turn of the 20th century. We also count uh, several Europeans or Hong Kong, Hong Kong natives, with often themselves being of European descent, who marry into these Canadian settlers and gain the Canadian citizenship themselves afterwards. And likewise, there's a few Canadian nationals, mostly women, who ended up marrying British nationals. But regardless of all of that, the Canadian government they didn't make any difference when it came time for repatriation. Basically, if they had their papers and if they had their passports in order, well, pretty much everything was fine with them and they were included in any return plan. The, you know, the plan was to bring back as many people as possible naturally. Just gonna take a sip of water. So Martin did a great job in explaining the conditions within Stanley Camp. So I will not repeat what he said. I will, however, just point out that the um, Canadian experience in the camp was seemingly not so different from what the British or the Americans lived through. Basically, you know, the Japanese didn't make any um, discrimination uh, regarding nationalities. And like Martin mentioned, again, the Japanese had the policy of uh, brutality towards the military prisoners of war. They will basically go out of their way to brutalize um, the POWs, but they didn't really have no such policy toward the civilian internees. So to be quite honest, they seemingly didn't care much about them. And again, as we saw with Martin earlier, uh, it led to living conditions that were frankly grim and mostly pathetic. The only note I want to make here is that the Canadians had the luxury, and I really put a quote here because it wasn't much at all, uh, to live through the first year and a half of the internment. That means, well, <clears throat> there's a lot of the internees that testify that the living conditions in Stanley Camp drastically deteriorated, deteriorated around 1944, in part because of the state of the war at the time. That means that the Canadians lived through, and again, I put a quote here, the bitter years of the camp. So they, it's not to say that they, they didn't suffer, uh, but they suffered through slightly less food shortage, slightly less epidemics, and with slightly fewer deaths uh, in the camp. So again, like Martin, I can't, uh, Mike, I'm sorry, I think we can just change the slide a bit. So right there, this is the slide of the, some of the Americans internees in Stanley Camp. Uh, I took this picture mainly just to showcase, you know, the demographic constitution. So we see women, we see children, we see uh, men. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find any pictures of some of the Canadians, so I just had to research uh, for the Americans. But yeah, so uh, we can change for uh, the next slide. I wanted to talk about like some of the more noticeable Canadians in Stanley Camp. Uh, I think they're quite famous among the Veteran Association. Uh, apparently, according to Mike, there's been some inquiries about them. Uh, so you might know them, but it's Caitlin K. Christie and Anna Mae Waters, the two nursing sisters uh, with the Canadian Army. So the two of them weren't interned at the same time as the other internees in January 1942, and they arrived much later in the camp. So they were first stationed at Bowen Road Hospital during the battle. Uh, they stayed there after the treaty injured at Bedridden, and it's only in August of 1942 that they got transferred in pretty much nebulous context. So starting from the January 1942 up to the year after that, there's a certain number of civilian nurses who were transferred from the various hospitals in Hong Kong, you know, Bowen Road being the main one, to Stanley internment camp. And 
Although the two nurses admitted never knowing the reason for the transfer, uh, May Waters theorized that the hospital staff might have been perceived as too large by the Japanese to treat the amount of injured and sick there. And according to one testimony I found from the surgeon Donald C. Bowie, at some times the Japanese order that all the, mil the military personnel treated they were to be transported to the POW camps, and that in consequence, several nurses were to be transferred to Stanley camps. And it is most likely that the Japanese didn't see the difference between their army status and that of an ordinary civilian nurse. Like I mentioned above, the Japanese led a policy of complete indifference regarding the internment of the civilians. As long as they were in Stanley camps, as long as they, as they didn't cause any trouble, we're kind of just gonna let them leave them to be. And I suspect that when it came time to return more civilians, but more people, I mean, uh, they suspect that they really don't, didn't bother too much uh, about checking out the statues of Kate Bear Christie and May Wilder. They simply saw two nurses among others and they decided to intern them with the other Canadian woman. So there is that. Uh, there's also the possibility of simply, you know, uh, the military period POWs camping camps comprised, um, constituted of mostly men, but pretty much all of them. Uh, it would be maybe would be too safe to, uh, to intern to women with them. But anyway, uh, we can change the slide again. So for the process of repatriation, well, this process started just a few days after the battle ended. Uh, the Allied civilians were barely rounded up for internment when the government of the United States contacted its Japanese homologue to settle for a prisoner exchange. And for this section, I would like to spare you the um, more intricate details and discussions between the Allies and Japan regarding this matter. Uh, but keep in mind that all these discussions, you know, starting from January 1942, all the way to the second repatriation in September 1943 were pretty long, they were pretty tedious, and they were about specific matters and details that are frankly not super interesting. <laughs> so instead, I would like to focus more on the grand steps of these discussions and Canada's place in them. So for the Allies, the well, naturally, the objective was to bring back as many of the citizens as possible, and their negotiations specifically targeted the civilian internment camps as the Japanese wouldn't allow for an exchange of military personnel. So at the beginning, the British and the American government made a joint effort to negotiate with Japan. Uh, this was at the request of the British government who evaluated that the United Front on that matter will be more apt to pressure the Japanese government. In that regard, the American took charge of representing its immediate neighbors who had citizens in, interned in Asia or had themselves in turn their own Japanese citizens. So some countries in Latin America, for example, but more point, mainly Canada. Uh, the British naturally took charge of the representation of their empire of the Commonwealth, so Australia, New Zealand, and so on, as well as the two French colonies that still, um, uh, that still uh, rallied themselves to the allies were represented by the British. But why was Canada diplomatically represented by the United States instead of by Great Britain, you might ask? Well, at first, the reason might have been purely practical. Canada naturally is a direct neighbor to the United States, and they already had an existing policy of collaboration regarding the German POWs in prison in the territory. So after having the blessing of London, Canada was officially represented in the discussions by the American. But it really doesn't mean that they didn't collaborate with the British on that subject, you know, far from it. The communication was still on. And also, the British wanted the United Front with the Americans regarding a prisoner exchange, their collaboration quickly fell through. Both of them actually realized pretty quickly that they had pretty much different objectives. Uh, mainly the British want, wanted to focus on internment camps located in Southeast Asia uh, and judged through inaccurate reports at the time that the camps in China weren't particularly dangerous in comparison and that the internees there, unfortunately, weren't urgent target for repatriation, again, in comparison to the camps in Southeast Asia. In contrast, well, the United States in accordance with Japan authorization wanted to repatriate the citizens in China and in Hong Kong as they saw them as priority targets due to their proximity to the Japanese island. Uh, mainly when they started discussion with Japan, Japan said, well, you guys can repatriate some of the internees, but we're gonna, only gonna repatriate the internees in, Chinese, uh, in China, Hong Kong and Japan. So the Americans kind of followed suit to that uh, regulation while the British wanted to be more, uh, wanted to um, discuss about some other uh, geographical uh, location. 
And with the British and the American being unable to reach an agreement, well, the two nations split apart and they decided to leave their own separate negotiations with Japan. So for Washington, uh, this led to the first repatriation in June 1942, which include their citizens in China, Hong Kong, and Japan. And in Hong Kong in particular, in Stanley Camp, this meant that the approximately 350 or so of the Americans internees had the luck to board the Azamamaru. And accompanying them were also three Canadians working for the government. So Edward Spencer Doughty, Paul Vernon McLean, and Jack Harper Middlefield, in case you might know them. And meanwhile, while well, the British government settled with Japan for their own prison exchange, which happened in August 1942, and mostly concerned camps in Southeast Asia. Thus, like I mentioned, Stanley internment camp in Hong Kong was exempted from this first exchange. But you may want to ask, why was Canada doing about this exchange? Quite frankly, it wasn't doing much. Because at this moment, well, the Canadian government was more uh, preoccupied about other matters regarding the war and pretty much left that issue to its allies. Um, and as well as to mention, Canada at the time wasn't much of a diplomatical uh, powerhouse compared to the British to the American. They barely had any con communication with Japan prior to that, and they barely had any presence in Asia in general. So for Japan's point of view, Canada was pretty much a minor actor in all of these, um, all of these negotiation circles. But understandably, under, understandably, Canada was quite happy to see back its three employees during the first repatriation. Uh, but from January to June 1942, matters were left to the British to take care of the returns of the internees in Hong Kong, the British and the American, I should say. But things kind of changed after the British led their own prisoner exchange. Because naturally, a prisoner exchange need to involve uh, Japanese prisoners. And for that, the British collaborated with Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia to use the Japanese nationals that were interned there. Mike, I think you can change the slide again. If you don't mind, yeah, there we go. So, uh, well, the exchange was successful. It was successful. It was successful. I'm sorry. Great Britain's ally found themselves frustrated by the outcome because Australia supplied the bulk of the Japanese prisoners to the exchange and was naturally expecting to have back an equivalent number of the citizens. Uh, so, on the contrary, of the 800 Japanese that they supply, we could put a quotation mark here, where only 63 Australian citizens entering Asia were repatriated. So the result of this exchange, which was pretty much um, unfair for the Australians' point of, view, point of view, and the insistence of Great Britain of focusing more on camps situated in Southeast Asia instead of Hong Kong or China in general, uh, while understandably preoccupied Ottawa, who favored to work more closely on this matter. Thus, we saw a more hands-on approach starting from fall 1942 all the way to the repatriation of the Canadians in September 1943. And like the first repatriation, well, the second one, uh, the second round of negotiation was entirely led by the American government. So in that regard, again, Ottawa was barely involved in the discussions, which were entirely led by Washington. Canada's role was simply to prepare itself for prison exchange and to exchange any relevant information to the Japanese governments. So this is where my slides come into play. As everyone probably knows, Canada turned something like, I think, 22,000 Japanese nationals during the war, and these people, even though they've been Canadian nationals since decades ago, or by birth, you know, First Nation immigrants or second, uh, or second uh, generation, or Issei and Nisei, uh, they were used as pawns for the exchange. Because the Allies didn't have any much of the military soldier that they captured to, uh, throughout the wars, Japan wouldn't let the exchange of military soldiers, so they had to resort, uh, as we could say, for these um, unfortunate people, the, these unfortunate citizens. So obviously the Canadian government couldn't deport their own citizens outside of the country, but it could try to convince some of them to leave. And understandably, while well, very few of them agreed to leave and to go back to work on Japan, which is, well, this is a country uh, that he quit several decades ago anyway, it would be like very much asking some of the Ukrainians in Canada to just go back to Ukraine right now. It would be pretty much um, impossible to do so. But luckily for the uh, few Canadians interning in Hong Kong, uh, these very few Japanese volunteers were just enough in numbers to guarantee the return of the Canadians in the Stanley camp. So in the end, the final number of the exchange, according to my research, amount to 65 Canadians interned in Hong Kong to 60 Japanese national interned in Canada. So like I said, from 22,000 Japanese, only 60 agreed 
uh, to leave, but this number was just enough to bring back the, uh, the Japanese, uh, the Canadian internees in Hong Kong. So at least there's that. We could uh, change the slide again, I think, Mike. Thank you. So in preparation of the second round of exchange, the Canadian government was exchanging information with Tokyo. So for example, Ottawa will mostly inquire about the military POW in Hong Kong and Japan and will ask them questions about, you know, about their health, about their location, about the treatments. So this round of negotiation about the, 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 the second repatriation mostly led to gather information about POW, the POW um, in Hong Kong and Japan. And in return of this exchange of uh, information, Japan asked mostly about the treatment of the Japanese nationals in Canada and of the internment. So while this information was shared, Washington and Mo in Tokyo were mostly busy discussing uh, the different means of proceeding to the prison exchange, you know, what part they're gonna choose, uh, with what ships, uh, what are gonna be the dates, um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. And finally, in August 1943, uh, the Canadians interning Stanley Kahn were notified by Fidel Sindel, which was the, uh, the Red Cross delegate in Hong Kong, that their repatriation will happen in the next few days. So the Tiamalu, which is a Japanese ship, arrived in Hong Kong on September 23, 1943, with already on board a few Canadians who were interned in China and Japan. Unfortunately, the Tiamalu was, uh, well, kind of... <laughs> They didn't have any great conditions inside of it. I, actually, a few Canadians describe it as being of nightmarish conditions uh, that were not unlike what the uh, health ships were like, or not unlike what the ships uh, where the POWs were to be transferred from Hong Kong to Japan were like. So the conditions were absolutely miserable. And I think at least one of the Canadian attorneys who was interned in Shanghai uh, died on board, unfortunately. Uh, but then, the ship arrived in the, the port to, to the port of Mahmugao in Asia. Uh, it encountered the MS Kenshan, which has uh, which was sent by the, Amer the American government. Uh, the exchange took place, and then everyone went to the American ways. So the Hong Kong internees arrived in New York on December the first, and then they took a train to Montreal uh, to the Station Bonaventure, actually, before going back home. And for them, fortunately, the war was over. And I think we just changed the slide there. Thank you. And fortunately for all of you, my presentation is also over. So I would like to thank all of you today for attending this conference. Uh, it was really a great pleasure for me to speak about my research today. But lastly, and with Mike's um, authorization, I wish I gladly thank, for, uh, thank him for, I would like to quickly promote the Jemisian project in Quebec. Uh, basically, we published a few months ago our virtual exhibition about the Battle of Hong Kong, and it's titled Impossible Odds. So our work is mostly designed for our high school students, but I'm sure all of you will find great interest in the work we have put out so far. And if you are interested about Canada and Quebec military history, I will suggest checking out our website. It's, we, I think we have pretty great contents. I think so, at least. Uh, if you have any questions regarding you know, my presentation, my research, honestly, I will uh, suggest you to contact through Mike, to contact me. I will be super open to uh, uh, answer your questions uh, to the best of my capacities. And well, in the meanwhile, thank you again to Mike Babin, to the HQBC, and for Martin for this presentation. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Julia. That was great. Um, lots of information there I had absolutely no idea about, and I'm sure people in the audience uh, are exactly the same situation. So we do have now a time for questions, um, and we have a couple of questions already from uh, members of the audience. So one uh, question from David directed to Martin. Uh, when you're guiding tours and giving comments and answering questions, um, are there any Chinese tour guides that are doing the same for any Chinese visitors? Yes, um, Mike, thank you. I, I was looking at Toward the end of Julian's presentation, I just had a quick look at some of the, uh, the questions there. Um, well, I mean, the answer is uh, yes, I, I'm happy to take anyone around. People often say to me, do you ever get Japanese people? I have to be honest, no. Um, but that's not to say I wouldn't. I only ever recall taking one Japanese couple, possibly language might come into it. But to go back to the gentleman's question about Chinese visitors, um, the answer is uh, there are uh, local tour guides or local companies doing this for Chinese people. Um, 
But of course, you know, obviously my presentations are in English only. And if anyone was not comfortable with the English language, then they ever, yes, they'd have to uh, go for uh, local tour guides. Um, Mike, I noticed that the gentleman goes on and asks a bit more. Uh, do you want to read that part out yourself or do you want me well, to go? Sure. So his, que his question is, were Chinese prisoners interned on the island or somewhere else? So I guess the first question is, were there Chinese internees? Uh, and if so, where were they interned? There were lots of Chinese who died during the Japanese occupation, hundreds of thousands uh, of them. Yes. Um, so, uh, so back to his question, were there Chinese prisoners interned? And if so, where? Okay. Um, I take it the gentleman's referring to um, internees, stating the obvious, you might say, uh, as opposed to military POWs. I but think that's what he means, yeah. I think we'll, we'll stick with um, civilians, yeah. Uh, the answer is no, the Japanese didn't make a conscious decision um, to inter Chinese, that would have just been impossible. But there were Chinese, um, particularly people married to Europeans uh, who went in the camp. Um, again, off the top of my head, one that springs to mind uh, was a Malay Chinese lady uh, who married a British policeman. In fact, there was a group of policemen who married uh, Chinese girlfriends, I believe, um, very close to the outbreak of the Pacific War. I think it was on the understanding that um, they would, uh, the Japanese would sort of treat them better, if you, as it were, um, if they were married to Brits or married to Europeans, but I don't think that really happened. Um, the lady I'm thinking of was married to a, a, a Brit policeman by the name of Plati. He died in internment. Uh, she was involved in the black market um, and she got badly beaten for her pains. So yes, there were Chinese who were interned, but it was the exception rather than the rule, I would say, Mike. All right, and Julianne, did you have something to add there? You were... um, as far as I was aware of, there was no camps dedicated to the Chinese. The Chinese were pretty much left to live among the Japanese occupation, which was very brutal against them. Um, I'm trying to think, I think like there was some kind of policy about the Eurasian population in Hong Kong. Uh, I remember finding an article about it, but I, I didn't read it, so <laughs> I can't say more about that. Okay, um, so the, the last part of David's question is interesting, uh, and I think I have understood it correctly. He's asking whether um, the Chinese government of today uh, Chinese government in China and in Hong Kong uh, recognizes uh, the fact that uh, uh, all of these people were interned, that there were deaths that took place during the, uh, the internment and so on. Is it something that's recognized by the government? Is it taught in the schools, for example? Is there any sort of uh, commemorative uh, activity that takes place? You know, Mike, a little bit difficult. Everyone's probably got their own point of view on this one. I'll just give you my take, as it were. Um, I think it's fair to say, official, I can't really speak, of course, in terms of the Chinese government, the CCP, the Communist Party of China. That's out of my league altogether. I can only speak from my own view about the Hong Kong government. Certainly, we do have commemorative ceremonies. We have the Remembrance Day here in um, November, and there is a commemorative ceremony for um, uh, you know, for the, for the um, defeat of the Japanese um, in August, I think it is. But the Hong Kong government aren't really uh, too much involved. They don't say, no, you can't. Um, but it's not, you know, there's not really much representation. We haven't had, for example, a chief executive since the handover turn up at the um, Remembrance Day parade. So although it, we do have those ceremonies and good that it's right that we do have them in my view um i don't think it's something which the hong kong government is making a big thing about and i think i'll leave it at that okay all right another question from allison we know that uh, the military prisoners of war uh in a very haphazard way received red cross parcels uh, most of them apparently were were diverted along the way what about the civilian uh, internees were they number one entitled to Red Cross parcels, and number two, did they receive them if, if they were entitled? 
Well, that's a very good question. And you could say the whole thing about the Red Cross, it opens a bit of a can of worms. Japanese didn't really officially uh, recognize um, the Red Cross. They, they were represented by a chap called Zindel uh, in Hong Kong, but it, it was a very sort of touchy um, mm. relationship. Um, my good friend, Jeffrey Emerson, who I think is probably listening today, uh, has covered this quite a lot in, in his, I, I, I refer to it as very much the go-to book, uh, Hong Kong Interment. Um, um, the answer is yes, there was a Red, Red Cross representation and Red Cross parcels did come in. They did come in, particularly mm -hmm. via Canada, but it was a little bit sporadic. Um, when parcels came in, you know, it was sometimes much later than they should have done. Perhaps some of the contents had gone off if it was foodstuffs. Um, and it was a little bit hit and miss, to put it to put it bluntly. So the answer is yes, there was Red Cross representation, and yes, Red Cross um, parcels um, did come in, but I would say uh, intermittently. Yeah. Right. You, you agree, Julia? Yeah. <laughs> no, I completely agree. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think just to add, I think like the Canadians when they were interned there. I think the only other chance to receive one or two parts of the Red Cross to give you a, an estimate to, uh, of the time frame of when they will receive them. Hmm. Okay. All right, well, Julia, here, a uh, question for you. Um, you gave the numbers about the number of Canadians who were interned and the numbers repatriated. So if uh, we understood the numbers correctly, there were about 73 Canadian civilians interned and 65 were repatriated. So what happened to the other, uh, the other eight? Yeah, um, so I know for this, I think there's at least like five of the French Canadian sisters that were fortunate enough to be released from Stanley camps at a certain point of the internment. Uh, I tried to find some context as to why they were suddenly released. I think what happened is that some of the religious uh, congregation, not congregation, it's not a good word in English, but some of the religious uh, orders there managed through the Cardinal of Hong Kong to have a, some kind of deal with the Japanese to release at least some of their members there. So there's a certain number of, for example, of the Marino sisters, uh, British and Americans, I think, who managed to get out. And with them, some of the younger French Canadian sisters, like I say younger, they were like in their 30s and their 40s, uh, also were fortunate enough to leave uh, Stanley Camp and to leave Hong Kong and to go uh, to other regions. In, in, uh, so so, in so they were part of a separate uh, deal, if you, if you want to call it that. Uh, yeah, it wasn't like some, some kind of a repatriation. They were just kind of left, left out. <laughs> Okay. And there was like a few of them that still that stayed in Stanley Camp. Uh, there was also, I mean, I'm real, I got a sort of shade because I never found much information about it. I found some kind of tra prisoner transfer from Shanghai, like from Hong Kong to Shanghai. There was at least, at least I think two Canadians, uh, one of them being like 14 years old, I think, who uh, managed for some really nebulous context. I never found out much information about it uh, to be transferred from one camp to another, but I have no more information about it. And there was at least at least one Canadian as well who wasn't transferred. Uh, I think he died in the camp in 1945. I don't know why he didn't get transferred with the rest. I assume maybe he just lost the pa his papers or maybe he was interned uh, in the present cell or something. Unfortunately, I really don't know. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, question from Susan. Uh, Martin, I think for you, how many children were in the camp? <laughs> Um, and she goes on, I think, Mike, also to ask, was the author Emily Hahn? I was just yes. trying to check that. Um, how many, I don't know. I really wouldn't give, like to give a figure. It must run into the hundreds, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I'd leave it at that. Uh, was the author Emily Hahn ever in the camp? Ah, thereby hangs a tale, the famous Emily Hahn. I think not. I'm going to hazard a guess and say no. Uh, Emily Hahn, um, I believe, managed to stay out Mm -hmm. um, rather spurious grounds. She claimed um, very much an American lady, uh, very much American. Uh, if anyone doesn't know of Emily Hahn, well worth um, digging out her books. I picked up one just the other day. I haven't even read it yet. Brand new, recently published. Um, she's long, unfortunately, gone, of course. Um, but um, I believe she claimed to, to, to be Chinese. Quite how she got round that. I'm not terribly sure, other than the fact she did have a Chinese lover. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there was, uh, whether she ever married him, I don't know. But she certainly claimed um, more than a passing relationship with this gentleman. And um, on that basis, she, she never did go in. 
um, into internment and was able to get away. She wouldn't be the only one. I'm going to slightly digress. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to hold up a book here um, written by an American, as you can see, uh, Jan Marsman. He was a very, very wealthy American businessman. Um, he was in Hong Kong on business. His family had uh, extensive business connections in Southeast Asia, in Asia generally. In the case of Hong Kong, they were involved in Wolfram. I think it's an American term, Wolfram. The British called it tungsten mining uh, in the New Territories. Long mined out now, of course. The Japanese uh, did take tungsten from the mines. Um, and he was in Hong Kong um, on business and uh, got caught up in the war, which he shouldn't have done, really. Um, President Roosevelt told me, don't hold anything back in writing this book. Good, good title, isn't it? above the title. Um, he never, he was never interned. He claimed to be uh, Filipina. And you can see from his photograph, he's certainly not Filipina, but he uh, had a chop or stamp in his passport, which said citizen of the Republic of the Philippines, uh, because he was an American and the Philippines was an American colony. Uh, so he managed to use his power, influence and money, etc., and get out um, uh, before he was due to go into the camp. He would have gone in eventually. I think Emily Hahn did a similar thing. I think she managed to uh, use her influence and a few other things um, and managed to avoid going in. Well, there were evidently a lot of creative people uh, out there. Um, actually, Margaret wants to know if we can get a list of the books mentioned along with the authors. And the answer is yes. Um, and uh, the easiest way to do that is will be on the, our Facebook page, which you'll find uh, a list of the books. We'll post it tomorrow, and you'll find uh, the the address, if you like, of the Facebook page in the email that everybody will receive after this uh, after this event, the follow up email. So Jerry wants to know. Um, St. Stephen's Hospital was the site of uh, of the hospital, as we all know. Did it remain a hospital? after the, the, the surrender hmm. or, yeah. was it, or was the building itself used? I think you mentioned, Martin, something about uh, a hospital. Was it at St. Stephen's uh, during the internment or was it elsewhere? Uh, well, it was certainly a hospital, Mike. Um, if you go to the school grounds now, it's called uh, Schoolhouse actually, the building is called Schoolhouse and it was one of the original buildings um, I mentioned earlier how St. Stephen's has moved from um, sort of popular and more western area um, in 19, the late 1920s, 1930. Uh, and uh, Schoolhouse is one of the original buildings. Um, the plaque at the entrance to the building um, talks about how it was shortly after um, the Japanese invasion of the colony, and I wouldn't argue that point, it was taken over by the British military or British authorities and, and pressed into service as a hospital. It wasn't the only school building, incidentally. There was another one, Salesian College at um, Chalki Wan, which of course is right in the middle of the uh, one of the landing grounds of the Japanese, or just a, not very far inland from where the Japanese landed on the North Shore, Northeast Quadrant of Hong Kong Island. Um, back to Stanley, uh, my understanding is, yes, it was of course a hospital, your father Mike, as you will know, um, that uh, very good documentary that your father was involved in, My Grandfather's War. Uh, your, grandfather, your father was uh, interviewed at the, um, in the entrance there, and he describes the horrors that he saw. Um, uh, yes, the building had been pressed into service as a hospital. Um, I believe after the British surrender, uh, that was it. I mean, it would have been cleaned up. Uh, the bodies of the 60 or thereabouts soldiers and nursing sisters, British and Chinese nursing sisters who were raped and murdered. Soldiers, of course, were murdered and they were um, uh, cremated as best they could outside in the school grounds and then um, put in the mass grave, which I mentioned earlier, where Captain Whitney is buried. And um, it was cleaned up as best it could. And uh, it was used by internees I don't think for accommodation. I think they used it for other purposes, meetings and possibly religious services and so on. But uh, I don't think, think it was ever used as a hospital again. There was another much well, better well-known hospital, of course, Tweed Bay, which was in the actual prison grounds, not the school grounds. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you. Uh, there's an observation here from Stephen who says that the Japanese were called turnip heads because seasoned turnips was and still is a popular food item in the Japanese diet. At, at least that's uh, Stephen's understanding. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I have seen that. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. Yes, I did read that. Um, I think the gentleman, I think Stephen's referring to something called daikin, which is a sort of white carrot, which is actually part of the internees diet. Not the most appetizing of foods, I believe. But I'm going to quote, uh, when I first saw that um, uh, question, I went to George White Newt's book, and I'm going to quote, if I may, the final couple of sentences in his introduction. And I'll read it out word for word, because I think it possibly answers it um, better than me. Even. <laughs> the Chinese and the Japanese are traditional enemies. The Chinese not only hate the Japanese, but also despise them. Strong words, I know. Their nickname for them in the Chinese dialect is Lorbaktau, turnip heads, hence the title of this book. So I'm afraid I can really not do any better than just quote uh, uh, George White News. I can only also possibly add my own late father-in-law, my wife is Chinese. I once asked him about this many, many years ago, and I said, did you ever call them Lorbaktau? And he said, yes, we did. And I asked him why. And he sort of mentioned the reason that I've already, which I had read already, i.e. the the way they sort of looked from behind. So I can only quote that. Okay, fair enough. Okay, um, I, I, we've reached the end of the questions that people have submitted. There is a very nice comment uh, from, uh, from Judy that said she just wanted to thank both speakers for the excellent presentations. She had not heard of these camps. And she's the daughter, uh, niece and great niece of three Winnipeg Grenadiers. So. Um, hopefully uh, others learned uh, things tonight. I know I did. And I want to thank both of you for, uh, for taking the time to prepare and, and to meet with everybody tonight. And before you all leave out there, I just would like to put in a plug for our next presentation, which is taking place on Monday, April the 18th. The topic I think will be of interest to both, uh, both the older folks, uh, like, like some of us, and not counting Julian on this, and, uh, and younger folks. The topic is Gander, uh, the Royal Rifles mascot, Newfoundland dog. And the featured uh, presenters will be George McDonnell, who many of you are familiar with, who is one of the four still living Hong Kong veterans, uh, and Sue Beard, who has collaborated with George on several of the books that, uh, that George has published, including an excellent one about Gander. So please uh, join us on April the 18th. Um, everybody listening here will receive uh, uh, an invitation by email to uh, to attend uh, around the beginning of April. So again, thank you. Uh, our mission in the HKVCA is to educate Canadians on the Battle of Hong Kong and on the battle's effect on, uh, on the survivors and their families. And I hope that you found this evening's presentation to be informative. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to uh, spend this evening and the morning, uh, this morning for those of you in Hong Kong. So thank you very much, everybody, and bye-bye.